Hey folks, this is Mark Devine. Welcome to the Unbeatable Mind podcast. Thanks so much for joining me. I've got an exciting guest today, Dr. Rahul Jandiel. Perfectly said. Brain surgeon, neuroscientist, UCSD guy. Dad. Dad. Author of an incredible book, Life on a Knife's Edge. A Brain Surgeon's Reflections on Life, Loss, and Survival. I'm super stoked to talk to you. Thank you for being here in person. Thank Ooh, you yeah. for having me. I'm a San Diego uh, almost native. My sons were born here, so yeah. it's a pleasure to be back. So you are both a brain surgeon and a neuroscientist. Those don't usually conflate into one career. Yeah, and I did From that. From my perspective. I, I did that seen. both in San Diego, both the brain surgery training and uh, the Ph.D. right here at uh, you know, Torrey Pines. UCSD. Right. Yeah, yeah, UCSD. Torrey Pines was where I did my lab work, uh, and uh, Hillcrest UCSD was where I did my uh, neurosurgical training. I mean, it was an in- intense eight years in San Diego. And my wife had yeah. three sons, you know, so it was just <laughs> Made a lot of more growth. Intense. What I- I'm curious is, like, how did your understanding of, you know, the subjective side of neuroscience, mm-hmm. you know, how – personality is formed and how trauma affects a personality and whatnot how did that play into your work as a brain surgeon where you're literally just looking at the physical Mm -hmm. structure and saying oh look i gotta cut that piece of Mm -hmm. cancer out that doesn't belong there yeah how did that affect your thinking well you're asking me now at age 48 with this book and it's partly why i was fortunate and lucky enough to share those thoughts in this book but that's a whole 25 year journey from the first time i saw you know, incision made and you look at the substance of the brain and it right. right away you're floored. I mean, it gets 20% of the blood flow, but it's shimmering white like, like an oyster. Amazing. So right away you look at it and you go, that's different. Um, from that to working on it, to caring for patients, to seeing the patient's journeys before and after brain surgery, that's when you start to really get into like, how does this affect their minds? How does it affect my mind? What are the lessons I can learn from somebody who goes on with life Mm -hmm. after having brain surgery, after being diagnosed with a cancer and showing up every three months to get a scan that might reveal something horrible, right? Right. That's a lot to live with. That's a lot of trauma to live with. That's Mm -hmm. a lot of stress to live with. That's a lot of, it's an overused phrase, but that's a lot of resilience they demonstrate. So Mm -hmm. I wanted to take all those words we're seeing tossed around Mm -hmm. And go deeper into, like, what the patients have taught me. Right. That's fascinating. I want to come back to that. But the book is um, Life on a Knife's Edge. You said this is your second book. You had um, Lessons Learned from a Yeah, Life Life Lessons lessons from from a Brain Surgeon. That's interesting. That's more of, like, brain, how it works, smart drugs, stem cells. Got it. You know, what you can do to prevent dementia. That's more brain. This one is definitely mind, my mind, you know, my patient's mind. Right. Well, speaking of your mind, um, I, I read the introduction and I got a little look into your life, but it sounds like you went from basically being a high school dropout, right? College for dropout, College yeah. dropout. So how do you go from, you know, from a college dropout to suddenly, you know, working toward your MD and PhD at UCSD? You fall in love. That's what happened with me. And I thought, like, I want to do more, you know, so I met my, really? my so wife. That could be time. motivating, huh? Jeez. Oh, man, I was... I mean, if that's funny, uh, meeting my wife uh, changed my life, and then having my first son changed my life. So, if I were if I were going to be, you know, just living the single life, I'm, you know, I'm good living on a boat, small place. I'm not, you know, most guys are right. I I (laughs) don't have a heck of a lot of needs. (laughs) I think so, and uh, and uh, you know, but when I met her, it was not necessarily that I wanted to like have a high power job but I wanted to sort of pursue my potential because that's mm-hmm. what she was doing mm-hmm. um, and so was we she did in it the together profession as well wasn't that we were I mean she was 19 I was 20 uh, mm-hmm. she was a dorm student I was working as a security card in her dorm <laughs> a security guard in her dorms and from there we went to medical school and uh, became surgeons and scientists and had three babies and that journey's all here in San Diego so it's great to be back but that was the um, you know, that's the the turning point. Uh, falling in love that's affects the mind, right? And right, therefore the yeah. brain chemistry and therefore the brain biology. And the next one was my son was born. Then I didn't just want to, like, fulfill my potential. I wanted to leave a legacy, you know, because mm-hmm. um, 
you know, I'll love my wife, but when I, uh, you know, when I saw the boy, and I was like, wait a second, there's, yeah, well, there's a world he's going to inherit. Mm-hmm. And if he ever looks back when he's older and says, wow, what did Pops do? Yeah. I want her to have a good story for him. And he actually drove me here today. Oh, that's cool. He's, How old is he now? Uh, he's turning 20 in a few weeks, and he's going up to Berkeley is where it? I met his mother. So it's just so much That's very cool. So much depth and joy to be back here in San Diego. Thank you for that's including cool. me. Oh, of course. So why the brain you know there's many paths you can take as mm-hmm. a med student and a doctor mm-hmm. and so why did you choose the brain what what pass you know what fascinated you about that well it's a li- it's probably a bit like you know um navy seals or astronauts i know there's a lot of mm-hmm. you know it's timely with that topic mm-hmm. but i was given the opportunity to become a brain surgeon i didn't apply into it i didn't have really? the marks to get into it i okay. went into general surgery i thought i was going to be a heart surgeon or a cancer surgeon um, breast oncology, maybe. My mom had breast cancer. She okay. survived. She's doing great. So I, I was going in that direction. So they had, they, they fired somebody. So I was a battlefield pickup. They're like, we're a body <laughs> short. We mm-hmm. only take one per year. They had seen me for a month. They said, do you want the job? Hmm. And so I jumped ship from general surgery to neurosurgery. Hmm. And why I did that was because of that thing we were talking about earlier when they invited me i said let me i hadn't even seen brain surgery you know i mean i wasn't a resident i mean i'd finished medical school i was in first year training i hadn't seen brain surgery because most medical students won't see a lot of these sort of elite surgical practices Mm -hmm. right that's not Mm -hmm. a normal rotation to do right and so i was like let me just you know can i actually see one before i (laughs) jump ship (laughs) can i try before i die okay (laughs) this guy's bizarre but we can work with that you know um and that's where they, you know, they made an incision from uh, sideburn to sideburn behind the hairline. And they flapped the skull forward. Mm. Uh, the uh, Excuse me, they the flapped skin. the scalp forward. And then they made some pilot holes just like you would, in, you know, in a wall, just bzz, bzz, with a pneumatic drill. And then they brought in a little, you know, a jigsaw and, the bzz, and they sawed it open and they took some fine chiseled. And, was, and I was like, wow, hey, is that even possible? Holy crap. At that time, I had already seen heart surgery and other things, and I'm, st- I'm looking at this like, wait a second, this is, this is another level. And, and they, were like, they were like, you're easily impressed, we're just getting started. And then they dissected between the corridors and the vessels of the brain, and I was like, this is something. But while they were doing that, I kept tripping out about, it's white and glistening. The whole time we've heard of the brain as like porridge and gray matter. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it is beautiful really shimmery glistening white bright blue bright red serpentine vessels on top of that so, and then i thought to myself again i'm in i'm in surgical training and i'm and i've i feel misled about the brain mm-hmm. and that was the first thought that 20 years later yeah, my images of the brain in if, the jar you know it's like right. einstein's brain yeah. you're like oh my gosh it's something <laughs> to see so then i started thinking to myself this is my opportunity to share with others that there's a lot of misunderstandings about the brain, you know. Hence that first book, and hence this book. I did um, went and talked to neurosurgeons at Harvard about five years ago, and I was impressed with that group too. And one thing I kept hearing from them is just just how relentless their work was there, and they were putting in like 130 hour yeah. weeks, 140 hour weeks. It's illegal now, but yeah, we did is that it back really? then. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering if you experienced that and what effect that had on you. Like, how can you, how can you concentrate well, on hour 110 and you're in a brain surgery? You know, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's an important question. So first of all, you know, we our shifts would be, it was too much. Yeah, um, it generated a certain type of surgeon. Also, somebody mm-hmm. who goes through that is uh, if they work in a small town, they'll get up every night for a couple of days and get it done because they've gone right. through. Yeah. hell if you will proverbially but now it's 80 hours back then it was you know we go in monday morning at 4 a.m come home tuesday at 7 p.m that's wow. one shift right but during that time you're not it's not like in the movies where somebody's dabbing your forehead and right you're, you're not on the table no the you're time. off you're off and on so you learn to cycle your energy and mm-hmm. i think that's and there's 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 these new things about like learning that it's the off period that allows you to actually absorb the information you're trying to learn and Mm -hmm. like off season Mm -hmm. in sports off periods when you're trying to acquire an intellectual skill there's new 
decision making so stuff coming out. Doing surgery for no. a period of months. No, sometimes the- you're sitting, sometimes you're bored. Like in the military, a lot of downtime, and then there's a crisis, and it's a, it's just a mixture of things. Interesting. So you realize how to which gear you need to be in. Right. If it's to go see somebody who's talking, and you go down the emergency room, they call you, you come in, but you're not really revved up. Mm-hmm. There's an emergency surgery that needs to be done. Then you go you turn it on right. You, you have you go into another gear, but you also learn to preserve those gears. And not to live under unnecessary stress mm-hmm. uh, because you need to save that. Yeah, that capacity. reminds me a lot of the, uh, what we learned in the SEALs, a very similar kind of energy management. Mm, and also, energy management, I like also that. Also, awareness management. Yeah. And so, there yeah. was a, one of the models we used was the Cooper Color System. And so, there I'm not know, familiar with that. Well, it's very simple. Like, the, the basic idea was that a color represents your state of awareness and readiness for action. Which is going to then also have a, Excellent. a neurophysiological effect. Yeah, so you're not hot when there's no need to be. Right, yeah. You can't be jacked up and get all this, you know, well, all you know, the they adrenaline have a thing about that. at all it's, times. You know, uh, so. Vigilance is decremental. Like right. air traffic controllers, soldiers, surgeons, right. you can't just be... Not 100% of the time. You can't be, so you have so to you learn. Have to, you have to modulate between them, I love toggle that. between them. So white represented just completely ignorant of what's going on. Mm-hmm. And you're never, you know, you're taught never to be in white. That would be like the average citizen. Oblivious, yeah. Oblivious, you know, just driving down the road, clueless what's going on. And so we were taught to maintain a state of what yellow, which is like passive alertness, mm. where you're, you're always kind of scanning. You're, you're, you recognize that um, there might be a threat at any moment, but you've modulated your energy, and you're, you're in a state of parasympathetic, and you're not mm. in sympathetic nervous, you know, kind of like fight or flight. So you're, you're calm. And then orange is like you've detected a threat, you know, like – ping comes in you're like oh shit i might have to go and you're activating yeah you, and that's when you spool up but you don't go to like all systems in red which is like action 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 but now you're more focused so instead of instead of I scanning like all around you you're scanning in a very specific direction toward the threat i like that let me jump that in there the other thing that does is no, from our point no, no i love that uh I benefited from that, <laughs> right. um, and I'll probably borrow that. And I'll of give course, you credit because no, no charge. Give it well, to that, Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> that ex- well, expl- it explains it well. But I think what happens there is if you just if you're always in startle response, you're not thinking. So a lot of times right. people ask you like, well, how do you how do you perform under pressure? Well, first of all, is it's not to be jacked up unnecessarily, and not to go to just hot without right. gradations. Right. So for example, white. Uh, in the hospital is never for a surgeon, never, right? Totally. I, or, you never know, for an And especially when right. you're driving home after a 40 hour shift, you know, you got, when you lock the door, you put the latch on, then it's white. Right. So I always knew that, like, hold on till you get home, not till you leave the hospital because right. we drive afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, hot is the decision to do an emergency surgery. So you walk up to something, you see someone, they don't look good, they're slipped in a coma, the scan shows something that if you jumped in, and evacuated that blood clot in 60 minutes, you could save their life. Mm-hmm. That decision is hot, right. Right? right? And then you've made the decision. Then you come back down to orange again. Then you're moving the patient. Like you're preparation. Get, and, right. You know, but you don't stay hot from the, the decision point all the way through surgery. Right. And even with the surgery, you get in the room that you step back a little bit. You let the right. anesthesiologist, the nurse help you a little bit. You let right. your team work with you a little bit. Yeah. And you step back. And then the next time you get hot is which side have I got to go on? Right. Because at yeah. Yale, not Harvard, there were some trainees, two of them, they operated on the wrong side of the skull. Oh, good gosh. So you have to know wow. uh, sidedness right. on a sphere. That's when I go hot again. Okay, right. then you, you've marked it the right place. Then you get into a ritual, like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, you know, incising the scalp and shaving the head. You don't have to be red on that. Mm-hmm. You know, you actually want to be somewhere, mm-hmm. you know, a little bit lower than orange. That's not operating. Mm-hmm. The, then you, even opening the skull is not a challenging thing. It's the opposite of uh, airplanes where takeoff and landing is hard. In surgery, it's the middle part. Mm. Opening and closing is is more routine. That's where you train people. Mm-hmm. But then you get to the part inside and you know this vein, ooh, that could be, then you go hot again. So in that like two hour thing that they show on TV and movies, you're hot in certain periods. And I say for a, an emergency brain surgery for a blood clot, you know, the total amount of time hot is maybe 20 minutes. Interesting. Yeah. That lets you be good and hot for, for those 20 hours, I love yeah. this conversation. Otherwise, yeah. people are like, oh, you must How just you be. Yeah. We know. use the acronym PBTA. Pause, breathe, think, and then act. And the act is what you're describing is hot. That's that's the freaking action. That's laying down lead. It's, yeah. you know, it's moving your position. Right. You know, it's, just, it's jumping out of the airplane. 
but it's impossible to be a good decision maker <laughs> if you stay hot all the time. Right. You know. So what? Let's talk about that. What specifically does that do? What are the the neuropeptides and mm-hmm. you know all the crazy things that when you're in fight or flight? What does it do to your brain and your? Awareness? Yeah, I could I could get deep into that, and I wrote about that here. I think first of all, um, let's let's go backwards a little bit. I don't I don't judge you know you know dad gets into a you know hits a grocery cart in, in front of Albertsons or Navy SEAL is you know squeezing off lead wherever you are that that stress or that threat is a personal dimension that's right right so I, I think people always think like well how am I gonna learn from you you're a brain surgeon I don't know am I doing brain surgery no but the process is the same whether you're fighting with your lover or your boss or you you got a flat tire. That's the same thing going on for your personal universe inside your skull. Right. Okay, so that said, number two, uh, what you feel, um, other than smell, you can tamp down. Mm-hmm. So let's, let's, there's five senses. Four of them, other than smell, they engage the frontal lobes, which is the part that ballooned our foreheads forward, mm-hmm. cognition. Mm-hmm. But we still have our emotional brain, the limbic brain. Structures mm-hmm. you've heard about like amygdala and all that, but it's much more complex than that. Right. It's not a switch. It's a tone. Interesting. Right? Yeah. And so when I, when I first see a snake on the ground, I jump back. Yeah. I didn't engage my thought. Something just made me jump back. Okay? Right. Then I look Triggers a little... a fear response. Right. But then I look a little bit more closely, and I see it's a plastic snake. Mm-hmm. The next time I see it, I don't jump back. Mm-hmm. So there is an ability to take things that affect us viscerally and think them down. A re, like a rheostat. Re-estat. But you can't do that with smell. You can never stop being disgusted with vomit. You can't just say, I'm used to that. So smell is an interesting olfaction, does not engage our cognition. That's just mm-hmm. like visceral. That's why smell of an old lover mm-hmm. associated with memory mm-hmm. is just, it just takes you, right? So... So what do you do? What, so if we know that not everything we feel at the emotional level has earned a right to stay inside mm-hmm. us. Right. It's in interesting. In the up. SEALs, we call that uh, sensitivity training. Right. So the, the more often you can experience something as close to reality as you can then the more you get desensitized to it right. and you're able to modulate yourself. You don't down. respond to you the plastic respond. snake. I like right. that. So what I do in surgery is... I run through crises the night before. That doesn't in your repl- mind, right? So you rehearse they, them. If I go this way, it'll be there. If I go around this corner, I might hit this. What do I do? I'd call for this. I run through my drills, my crisis management, by simulating it in my mind. Do you do that for specific patients, or or for gen- generally for me tomorrow as a you know whatever no, no, comes o- up? Only for cases that have only got me losing sleep. Okay, got it. Right, because yeah. not every operation is challenging. Every patient is important. Right. And you can't get the risk down to zero, but you know when you're taking on a big case. Right. So I have my own rituals on how to do that. But just to go back to what I was saying is, is um, so emotion and stress and threat, and back to what you're asking about, you know, flight versus fight, um, or sometimes freezing up, mm-hmm. you know, that there's, there's more nuance to that. Those responses are partly in our control. I'm not going to say I won't freak out. I'm not asking anybody else to not freak out. I just want to introduce the concept that we can learn to not be afraid of heights. We can learn to not jump when we see a plastic snake. Mm -hmm. There's something cognitive going on where we can learn to tamp down our emotions. Mm -hmm. That introduces into me the biology of of, uh, emotional uh, regulation, Mm -hmm. stress management. All those things come with the premise that just because I feel it, just because it's coursing through me doesn't mean I have to react to it. And mm-hmm. the last way I would explain that to you is when you do have that sympathetic fight, flight, whatever, that, that surge happening, there are measurable things that happen. Right. You know, there's a, behind your, between your eyeball, uh, eyeballs and behind your nose, the pituitary releases mm-hmm. things, above your kidneys, different things happen mm-hmm. without going into the names or whatever, whether it's, you know, uh, cortisol or not, but mm-hmm. there's a whole cascade of things that happen. Mm-hmm. There is a type of tumor where the adrenals are kicking out all that juice all the time. No kidding. Right? But because those kids are not under threat, if you check their blood, it says fight, fight flight. Mm-hmm. But they're like, hey, what's going on? Their blood pressure is high. But because the brain has not permitted them to feel stress, the physiological 
chemicals and hormones are not enough for them to freak out. Hmm. So it's interesting. It, it, it's it happens because we we let it to. Mm-hmm. Now it's largely out of our control, but it is a bit in our control. So if you can get from one percent to two percent control of your emotions it and stress, almost like you cognitive can do behavioral therapy. Yeah. Well, that's what they're trying to do is walk you off right. of that gently. Do you think that works? I know you talk about trauma in your book. Do you think um, you can think the emotions down with trauma? I think. So. I think. Oh, this is a great question. Um, I think. Let me, let's just back up because I love explaining. My kids get always yeah. get me. They're like, you can't just jump into all that, like you know, technical <laughs> stuff. It, if you lose memory as a surgical complication, mm-hmm. there is no trauma. There is no PTSD. So first of all, you got to have memory. So to feel is traumatized related to memory or memory is yeah, is it's a, the traumatic memory of the trauma, right? right. Okay. Now memory is malleable. Mm-hmm. It's not a it's not a fixed thing. Mm-hmm. It's always tied into emotional context and mm-hmm. smell and senses. Mm-hmm. So traumatic memories can be revisited Mm -hmm. in certain contexts to lose the emotional impact that they're connected with. You still remember, gosh, that happened to me, but it doesn't grip you. It doesn't make you stay in bed. It doesn't make you go to a dark place, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, traumatic memories can be revisited. Is it easy? Is it, uh, it depends on the trauma. I'm not gonna tell people like, hey, yeah, your kid died and you should work those traumatic memories out. No, 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 I'm just introducing these things that explain what is possible. Mm -hmm. And I think people, I think that's what people wanna know is, is it possible or not and how? And then they can can apply it to their lives whenever, whenever they can, you know? That's interesting. So, Gosh, I don't, you know, you you come to patients or patients come to you after, usually after they've detected a tumor. Mm. How, like in most of your patients or in your experience, like how long does someone live with a tumor in their brain before they ever become aware of it? it there's a whole world of uh, cancers of the brain mm-hmm. from non-cancerous tumors mm-hmm. that they can have for decades and we, it only comes to, you know, attention because it's slowly grown and is knuckling into the brain. Mm. To things like Senator McCain and uh, President Biden's son's brain tumor, that's the actual flesh just goes bonkers and awry and sprouts a cancer. Mm. That's a whole range of not deadly to deadly within a year or so. And so that, that world of cancer brain surgery is what I'm in. Mm-hmm. But there's a whole range of things that happen, happen in that sphere. Right. And just like any other cancer, you know, there's usually some sort of underlying condition. I mean, it could be genetic, but oftentimes there's a lifestyle or mm. a belief or a fear, you know, or trauma that somehow slowly manifests itself as a cancer. Is that, well, I would respectfully that? disagree with that. I, I, I think stress might cause something, but I don't know about belief causing. I don't think that link is there that, that I've seen. I, I know stress can cause a lot of problems. <laughs> totally get that. I don't know how they would ever study that. Anyways, right. You know that, what I mean? That's a great way to describe it. I right. always say that. How would, well, how how do would they show you study that? that right? Yeah. But we know stress is r- related to lots of physiologic diseases and inflammation, mm-hmm. and inflammation can lead to mm-hmm. cancer, but inflammation is good also. Everything has mm-hmm. a, is a dual-edged thing, that's right? right? Yeah. Um, but what about toxins, you know, like yeah. environmental toxins or, you know, exposure to something so, bad? Yeah. So let's look at Chernobyl. Mm-hmm. Like I go to Ukraine and I've been on the edge of Chernobyl there with the gowns on and stuff like that. So now we have some experience from that, mm-hmm. you know, like the wolves have taken over the t- certain towns and stuff like that. It's a, something to see. That's crazy. It's like beyond, you know, it's apocalyptic in the real sense. Is it? But they're they're finding a lot of. There weren't that many differences in certain cancers, but skin and thyroid cancers they found were going up. Mm -hmm. And that's partly because skin and thyroid is turning over a lot, you Mm -hmm. know, Mm -hmm. it's shedding and making new stuff. So when that radiation hit it, the DNA was damaged and it created cancerous cells. So things with high turnover are the ones that radiation is affecting. So for most brain cancers, Radiation can lead to that. They had radiation for some other cause. But it's not like colon cancer, like your diet's bad and you definitely higher chance of colon cancer. It's not like certain hormone-related cancers, not like smoking and lung cancer, where lifestyle choices increase the chance. They don't guarantee, 
but they put you in a more likely bucket to get cancer. That's interesting. With brain cancers, it's just kind of bad luck unless you've had radiation. Yeah, that, see, I would have thought that lifestyle factors would have had a, a play in it. Not for brain, but for, for almost all the other ones. When someone has a stroke, is that something that you also deal with or are you strictly dealing with cancer? We're, we're trained in the management of, so stroke is, stroke is a brain attack, right? Like we know what a heart attack is now, like the mm -hmm. arteries on the surface of the heart, when they get clogged, they're fine. There's the thin ones. It's mm -hmm. a heart attack is not blockage from within the chambers of the heart. It's the vessels that are supplying the muscle of the heart on, on the surface. Mm -hmm. And basically you get a clog in the plumbing. And so blood flow can't get past that clog mm -hmm. and the tissue past that distal to that uh, dies in the brain it's the same thing vessels are going up if you knock off a branch whether it's through surgery or a clot whatever it was irrigating with blood is now not getting that blood and that that swath of brain dies mm -hmm. in strokes they can it can die or it can die and explode if it dies that little swath dies and explodes and there's fresh blood there then neurosurgery gets called because we might have to remove it otherwise the other doctors take care of it one of the things the guys at Harvard told me was, you know, kind of back to your point, how this, we know so little about the brain and we're always learning, is that they're starting to heal people, complete recovery mm. from strokes. And the sooner they can get on it, obviously the more effective That's they the key, are. yeah. And the so- less long The less long the lawn is dead, the more likely you right, can get you it back by watering it. it. Yeah. Right, yeah. But I, apparently that's kind of relatively new procedure. Mm. And you would think yeah. that that would have been something that someone would have tried in the past. Yeah, I mean, they're breaking clots up with little, uh, you know, with wires and, yeah. and blood thinners and stuff like that. That whole field is expanding. On the other side is, like, neurosurgery going on at UCSF. They got they have a, a just talented neurosurgeon who is putting electrodes in, and it was in the cover of New York Times and other journals, like, after lots of training sessions, like years and years, somebody who, without the ability to speak after a stroke with electrodes in could think and the computer would pop up words I read that. as communication like to me that's that kind that's of fascinating like carpentry is great plumbing right. is great i love doing that I like the working my hands link. yeah what do you think about that like, well, where, I, where are we going with that technology well, I, I mean i i think uh, super rich folk are are trying to you know put their name on um anything that's going to be sexy and forward thinking so mm -hmm. that's fine you know neuroscience and space exploration right, right, right. um but there's there's getting into something and then there's getting into something and over promising right, right so right. i don't i don't know much about spaceships and you know these guys you know businesses they hire astronauts and it seems like they're doing a good job i respect that mm -hmm. but it's too early for business people to, to think that they can drill a hole in a skull in, you know put some glue in there plant a chip plant a chip and next thing you know you know you you can you can look at instagram on your phone without having to push the buttons with your thumb right, right. like i get where they're going with that but that's way farther away than spaceships right and that's and so what, what all i would say is i like it but let's let's follow some of the things coming out from people who have been injured after right. s, s, you know like Get Before people we walking again first, exactly. Yeah, That's ex you read my mind. Like I get that. Yeah, you know I get that. But let's demonstrate. God, there was this. There was this ridiculous thing. This bullshit going on a couple years ago. They're talking about the head transplant, and they asked me <laughs> about it. Yeah, apparently some guy claims he's done yeah, it in China. Right? Well, yeah, Japan. you know, if, if I don't. If it ain't if it ain't happening in a prominent city, right. with uh, you know people from different. Uh, disciplines looking at it right. and understanding it. A lot of that is headlines, and it, and it did get it, and we're still talking about it. But back to getting people who are paralyzed walking, um, they, they asked me, I was like, well, you can connect muscle to muscle, bone to bone, vessels to vessels, but I have yet to see a single case of where you can connect brain to brain and have it grow into each other and function or spinal cord to spinal cord. Like, you can say that that you could do all that stitch work for a head transplant, but mm -hmm. that spinal cord will never the spinal cord connected to the head, the well, little stump it of it won't integrate with won't, the body. That's spine. the right word. Won't integrate with the spinal cord that comes with the body. So it's a flawed concept because we haven't even done it in universities. Right. So going back to that guy with electrodes at UCSF, that's nice to see. That plus twenty more of those, then maybe Neuralink. 
But right. bringing up Neuralink now, when we're 20 steps away, you know, is like bringing up space exploration when you just you're talking about the Model T. Mm -hmm. It's too far away, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Is AI playing any role in your field yet? Not mine, but all those things where they look at pictures and stuff like like pathology and uh, yeah, dermatology, of you know, visual analysis. Studies, yeah, visual analysis. Yeah, I can see how that they played. did try to get into cancer with Watson. Remember the, the mm -hmm. you know the world's yeah. most advanced computer and and trying to sort of standardize what kind of chemotherapy to give patients. It, it stumbled out the gates. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, totally. They should look at that. It's just like no, there's just too much nuance. Right. Because it's not just cancer. It's you had the cancer five years ago, you got treated partially, then you had chemo, maybe you didn't, maybe you had surgery. If there's over 200 cancers, mm -hmm. and then there's so many different stages of treatment, it's hard to come up with an algorithm for that. You know, I'm not against it, but it, it's not ready for prime time yet. Right. And one more techie question. What yeah. about um, robotics? Are you using any robot robotics to like cut the skull open or anything like that? So people ask me about that. The way to think about this is the robots are still controlled by our, you know, by your hands, yeah, by our hands on the module. What the robots are great at is getting into cavities. So if like if you place your fingers can't fit or your well, instruments, or yeah, two surgeons with two hands, you know, and it's like we're we, we're gonna both try to work underneath the liver or in the belly. It's gonna need you're gonna have to have a big incis incision to have you know four hands see, in there. Right. So the robots are great because they're like little, you know, they're almost like McDonald's straws. You know, they're narrow and they have pincers, pincers and little coagulation things. So you can get three or four little working things in there through some ports, and so they get much smaller incisions they do much better what about nanotech is, is anyone working on that for brain? <clears throat> nanotech is the way i try to describe it to my kids is um you know how you can put you can put flavor on candy you can't see it but there's some element that's been modified on the structural thing which is candy and then, then you can put drugs on metal so those heart attacks we were talking about they put drug eluding stents so it's bathing uh, you know, blood thinner so they don't scab off. Nano is actually just a lot more scale microscopic on that. Mm -hmm. And people are looking at that for like the integration. You get a fracture, you put a screw in there. A lot of times the screw pulls out, just like you put the screw in a drywall, you hang mm -hmm. a painting on it, it pulls out. Nanotechnology is something like that's good for now, at least in the orthopedic sense or in the spine surgery sense where the screw is more likely to integrate your word with the cells of the bone so that's 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 one side and the other is sort of like matrix you know delivering things that are going to swim around our brain and and fix things and repair things and that's much farther off yeah yeah similar to our other discussion on Neuralink. that's way down yeah. the road fascinating though to see where that's going to go yeah though, you know we got to take a look at it just yeah, for sure we just can't do people with over promising stuff that's you know? right so you tell some amazing stories um, in your book. Let's let's pull out a few of the most impactful ones, mm -hmm. where either you saved or did not save, a, you know, a life on the table, and what you learned from it, like what what lessons you learned about courage and resiliency, and you know, some of the things that really have impacted your life. Well, that made you a different person, a better. That's person. a big question. Yeah. Um, that's a big question, I guess. I guess the first thing I would say is, you know, at this moment when you when you're talking to me, I've been in better psychological places in my life. I'm mm -hmm. going through a difficult time. Interesting. Uh, that doesn't mean I think everybody in this country right. is, is probably on that same right. And through other boat. personal things and stuff yeah. like that. And what what I what I like to do first of all is let's go to the concepts. And again, and that way we can back the, back back the story in it, right? Like, yeah. so resilience is a word I hear all the time. And, you know, I just, I, I struggle with that word a lot because I'm seeing it in pop magazines and stuff like that. And I'm starting to see my patients and other people feel like, oh, I didn't deal well with that diagnosis. Uh, maybe I'm not resilient. No, mm -hmm. that's not, a, that's, that's, it's not meant to make you feel bad about yourself, mm -hmm. first of all. But when I, when I looked into that, I found that there were two types of resilience from a, you know, Engineering is just, you know, you take a stress or a strain and then you come back to your natural shape. Or your original. That, this, is, this is different. Psychologically, it's more about, there's two types in my opinion, systemic resilience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're battle tested. You've gone through a lot 
and now there's a new situation you're in. You come with a certain resiliency right. that you built through your life. You carry it with you, and that lets you handle what's coming your way. Mm -hmm. It does depend on what's coming your way. Mm -hmm. Did you get into a car accident, or did you lose a child? Mm -hmm. Very different. Mm -hmm. Then there's processive resilience. That's what you're going to bring to the fight that you don't even know yet. Mm -hmm. And that's those definitions leave us completely wide open to however we're coping right now. That's right. I get horrible news. I'm not doing well. Well, I'm developing and potentially growing from this. Through these narrows, through these struggles will come strength, right? Mm. And that, so then you don't have to feel bad that you're not doing well because this might be something that's very seismic in your life. Mm -hmm. Again, losing a loved one or maybe just psychologically the loss of a pet. I can't, I can't categorize what is stressful or not. It's an individual experience. But if you have, if you see, res, you know, being resilient is something you one carry, but also have the opportunity to demonstrate, to deploy, yeah, yeah, to yeah. deploy. Then it's a more open and a topic, and it gives us a reason to keep trying to be better. Right. And what I've seen in my life is that that it's not a linear trajectory we're on. There's seasons mm -hmm. of our life of mm -hmm. of dormancy, of darkness, of winters in our life, mm -hmm. or a flourishing. And mm -hmm. what I, what I love about that way of thinking about it is that. W you know, wherever you are, there's something optimistic. And it actually follows what happens with neurons at the microscopic level. Mm. If you are under no stress, stem cells discovered here in San Diego by Rusty Gage, he showed it the human neural stem cells that we can actually sprout new brain cells. Mm. Not a lot, but some. They go to smell and they go to memory, interestingly. The, that if you're under no stress, your brain won't spr sprout new neurons. <laughs> Says, hey, I got it covered. Mm -hmm. If you're, it, it's dormant. If you're under a lot of stress, it shuts down too. Like, oh, I'm overwhelmed by this. Interesting. But a, a modest amount of manageable stress is the molecular cue for the little neural stem cells, little seeds to squirt out more neurons. And I think with that sort of thinking at the biological level, seeing your life more as seasons, mm -hmm. thinking of yourself as you know, resilience is something you cultivate, you carry and cultivate, right? These, this way, I think people are both inspired and it's more accurate. That's great. That said, yeah. um, I think what people misunderstand about surgeons is that it's like auto shop or we always fix something the same way, you know? And what they also don't realize is in complex surgery, and a lot of knee transplants, you know, you put the metal in, you make the pilot holes. I could see it gets like that, even sewing arteries in the heart. But in cancer surgery where the tumor is different shape and erodes and invades anatomy in different ways, there's a lot of judgment going on. Right. And I think that's the part surgeons don't get credit for. Like, maybe I've taken enough. Man, if I go around this way, uh, maybe maybe I, I use a smaller scissor over here in case there's a vessel. Nah, there's nothing mm -hmm. over there. I can save time and lower complications for patients by going fast here. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of judgment going on. So when you ask old timers, you know, veteran surgeons, they uh, will say, yeah, good hands is, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's fine. But I'll take somebody with above average hands and superb judgment. Mm -hmm. And I think surgeons don't get a lot of credit for that. In some of the cases that I've done, there are three allowable good roads forward. Right. And you choose you one, you choose got it in your one. head, and then the patient has a complication. In your experience, how big a role does intuition play in the final judgment? Great question. Um, that's a great question. Um, in surgery, if you are tackling tra trauma surgery, things are falling apart, mm -hmm. and you have to make quick decisions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Or you're doing cancer surgery, I do think there's there are some people that have better intuition. Right. I, I don't know how to explain it, but when yeah. you see and you're working with them, it's not like oh their hands move more. Sw it's not so, it's not robotic. It's 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 the theater. Right. It's the ballet of what they're doing. They took out this bleeding cancer from the liver, and they did it in three hours with 300 steps, and the other person does it in six hours with 800 steps and a lot more blood loss. The same work done with finesse, yeah. You know, do you, you don't just keep you know, your scissors. We part a lot. Some surgeons they can they they do one, and then a wider one, and the tissue falls apart, and it's only in two steps. The patient feels it less. 
less time, less maneuvers by the surgeon. Others, snip, 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 snip. It's just, it's a different thing. Interesting. There's a, there's an artistry to. I'm getting a little squeamish, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> <You just> <laughs> <laughs> by snipping. The, the, uh, there's an artistry to it. And when you right. see that some people are better at it, it's not because they're smarter. Right. There's something. And, it reminds and it, me just two the I- drill. idea of mastery, you know. It's like Exactly. You, two minute drill you in, don't know in how or why you can do it in 300 or 600 steps versus 800 it just happens and you can't even probably go back and well, well, quarterbacks, point to what you did different the quarterbacks were the pre- best example like yeah. the ones who can throw the ball through the, the tire in practice it's a totally different situation under pressure mm-hmm. moving pieces clock timing mm-hmm. some people seem to do better at the end of the game right. clutch performers some people like to call them but there are those in surgery as well and I think that is intuition it's yeah. not a Oh, I'm better at processing. I know the anatomy more. No, it's something. They got something. something you know, it's yeah. a. And I just want people to remember: surgery is a physical task. It's, right. and we have our own sort of Olympics of sort where we know this person is talented. He, yeah. some people can actually do an operation that other surgeons can't. Yeah, and then sense. you say, hey, well, that's interesting, and you refer those patients that need that to them. Right. The discussion about resilience reminds me almost on the other end of the spectrum about the difference between peak performance which is like got to train yourself to get in the flow state for an event or for a surgery mm-hmm. or for a firefight in the case of sure. seal and sustained optimal performance mm. right and there's certain things that's where diet nutrition sleep all the recovery the, the breath practices mm. you know can lead to sustained optimal por- performance from which you can peak right without going through these wild cycles of needing major downtime or burning yourself out so like it's that. almost on the flip side of resiliency, what you're talking about. You have the, the resilience of being able to bring it in a moment and not having it you know, crush you in return, plus the resilience of just being able to deal with the life's ups and downs and, and allowing yourself to stay in that range where the challenge is leading to growth and not breakdown. Stay in that range where the challenges lead to growth. I like that. Yeah. I think creativity is sometimes similar to that. People are like, Definitely. you don't just sit down and like, no, you got you got to be learning everything, right? Before you can have well, that. There's a lot of resistance with creativity. Right. right? Any artist, they're like, it's, sometimes as an author, how many times you look at a blank page and just go like, I got that, nothing here. In the crisis, <laughs> that came out. Yeah. And I, and then like later on, I would think you know I was writing this in my garage and like February, March, April when I was sensing the storm coming through, and I was trying to alert people. I was like, this is something coming through. And I was, this was like- You mean the pandemic. Yeah, this exploded out of me. Um, Interesting. And then like a month or two, I was like, I think I have maybe a a third book. I try to write it down. I was like, this is shit. It's just just hollow. So I need to be under pressure to, I don't know what it was, but it's, I think creativity, what people think, you can't shortchange actually, to be creative, you got to know the landscape first. Mm -hmm. And I think to have peak performance, you got to get in shape first. You got to get all those other things done, yeah. and then hope in that moment that you can channel right. or drift towards a performance that's better than you expect for yourself or have demonstrated in practice. Mm-hmm. You're not just gonna you're not gonna turn into Jordan, mm-hmm. but if you beat your best under pressure, to me, that's peak performance. And I think in the operating room, under pressure is what differentiates surgeons. Right. When the pressure comes on, you can see the people's bodies lock up hands lock up just just, you know freak out Mm -hmm. you know calling for help Mm -hmm. nurses are sometimes hey hey, hey, calm down I mean it's not it's not the uh, you know it's not the perfected movements we imagine uh, all surgeons to have and Mm -hmm. how could they you go to medical school you get into surgery they don't even look to see if you can cut or throw or it's like going to it's like going to the nfl without going to the combine Mm -hmm. they so you take people into surgery without ever seeing if they have technical skills and then you put them into the most technically challenging thing with their hands so you're going to get people that aren't good at it interesting and but yet they graduate them usually what they do is less difficult operations so, so. We, we try to steer them to change the tires change the tires right don't 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 do engine overhauls and and, and so how do they start getting that experience where they're they're going to have to you know they're going to be able to do the overhaul eventually oh they know you can't you can't you can't be a navy seal not everybody can <laughs> <Good> <laughs> no point. you get selected out of that no you're right. not you, this is you don't want that you are not going to let you in and you're not going to be good at it you don't want to hurt the patients you don't want to be under that stress be happy with tire changes interestingly some of the surgery, the 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 re, you know the money, you can make more money changing tires than engines often, in our world. Right. And so some of us do it for the glory, mm-hmm. 
And, you know, dentists get paid more for root canals than some surgeons do for removing a cancer from a woman's breast. Are you serious? Mm -hmm. Interesting. And it's not about the money, but the point is, why do we go for that? It's a bit of the glory. It's the pride that comes with doing certain work, and we get right. paid ample. It's not, no complaints here. But the ones, it's not like, it's not like people go into engine overhaul because it pays more. You know, they go into it because they like going into the shop and taking on that project and performing and demonstrating that craft. Mm -hmm. There is value in that as well. Mm -hmm. So in our in our hallways, it's not the one who, who's making the most money that's got the cred. It's the all those rooms. You know who's doing the big cases. Mm -hmm. No matter what the background, gender, disability. Some people have you know physical disabilities. Some people are older, or younger. They it's when when you demonstrate that skill, all of that stuff doesn't matter. That's you cool. know. And so to me, it's a very egalitarian. Place. And we do in our pajamas, which I love. It's like, <laughs> you know, you can't wear a watch. And you have to take off your ring. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you're bare with your skill. That's interesting. What, you know, you face and have to inform people of their impending demise. And then Often. you have to deal with them, you know, through whatever process that they have to go through. And learn from them. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, what is, you know, one of the biggest or, or some of the biggest lessons that you've learned about death that helps you live your life or understand your life? Well, it's, uh, it's a big question again, but I, I think it's, it's a, a quote from Kafka. I was flipping through a bunch of different stuff and I ended up like, you know, the meaning of life is that it ends. Mm -hmm. And cancer patients, I would say a great majority has shared with me that they wish they had didn't have you know they wish they wouldn't have waited until a cancer diagnosis to prioritize quality of life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, getting rid of relationships that didn't work for them um, doing the things they wanted to loving the people that they you know had maybe been estranged from you know those things mm -hmm. they do in those last few years mm -hmm. they wish they would have lived like that the whole time mm -hmm. and for me I I'm benefiting from their challenges and I don't carry the real weight. I don't have a cancer diagnosis, but I see them navigate that. And that if we could see that the finish line comes for us all, not in a macabre way, yeah. not in a freak out way, but it's yeah. sort of like the time is precious even when you don't have a cancer diagnosis, mm -hmm. that, that we would reprioritize things and we would uh, value different things individually. For somebody that might be taking up a hobby, somebody that might be giving up a hobby. I'm not mm -hmm. trying to tell people here the five things to do to have a quality of life, yeah. a great life. No, well, how, how did that's for yourself? You? Like, what did you change? Um, you know, it was probably like one or two things that you changed in an instant. One day you just had that epiphany. It's probably more likely that you just kind of over time started mm -hmm. to reflect upon it's, this and say, what do I really value and how do I want to Exactly right, yeah. It's been glacial. Has it? Yeah, it's been glacial because so much in the beginning was learning the craft. Mm -hmm. Then it, there was more time to processing and reflecting on the lessons that I had learned from them. Mm -hmm. And then there was adding in the biology about how our brains handle stuff and, and you know. But for me at 48, um, I think the lessons that I've learned from them is to, is to brace and be prepared for challenges but don't anticipate them so much so that you live in fear of them. Mm -hmm. And the way they've taught me that is their brain, their scans. Every three months after the diagnosis, they get a scan. They call it scanxiety. And so what, I, what they've taught me, what we work together with is have a horrible week. When that, you know, that slip comes for a brain MRI or body MRI, it's going to be stressful. Mm -hmm. It's actually, it's better to just have that rough week because that's normal because you're going through something very difficult and you might find information that's completely life altering. Mm -hmm. And you do that every three months wow. for years. So, but what they also do is in between, they don't, uh, they do their best to save that anxiety for that week. So they compartmentalize, but in a very methodical structural way, it's not just getting rid of anxiety. It's like you said, when we started this conversation, knowing when to get hot, and then not being hot unnecessarily. That is the true, you know, the, the, you know, the approach to equanimity that I think, like if you look at Buddhist philosophy and they say don't, you know, you know, 
be the be the path that doesn't react too much to negativity and positivity, right? Sort of mm-hmm. equipose. I mm-hmm. would say what cancer patients do is a bit differently. The ones who are that I looked at, so this is amazing. They they are they buffer the pain and the difficulties, but because time is limited, they really celebrate and savor life in between. They mm-hmm. are they are parting, enjoying with reckless abandon in between those those weeks where they get their scans. It's not just about blunt the highs and the lows. It's actually blunt the lows and relish in the highs. Mm-hmm. It's a very unique approach that I've seen in cancer patients. When someone first learns, let's say that they have a two years, three years to live, mm-hmm. do you see that trigger uh, prior trauma, like childhood trauma, and then have a lot of people go into like a downward spiral as a result of trauma that preceded the yeah. cancer? It's a good question. I'm not in a position to answer that because I don't know them from before. So oh, surgeons see right. you right. at sort of, it's punctuated. Um, right. I'll, I'll tell there, you why there I doctors. question in a yeah. second. Okay. The other doctors, you know, who fall in throughout their lives might know that. You know, your general practitioner might know that. Right. But when you see when you see cancer surgeons, it's you know it's you're, for you're a few not months. privy to that. Like it would be right. the therapist who would probably uncover that. Yeah, yeah. Because what we found out, I work with um, with vets, mm-hmm. that, you know, trying to help them heal from post traumatic stress. And what we're finding is, yes, they have that combat trauma, mm-hmm. but most of their struggles come from pre existing trauma that has been triggered and exacerbated by the combat trauma, unroofed. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So I imagine the same thing could happen. You know, and I, in the book, I mentioned uh, there are people who have PTSD, yet they've never been combat veterans. You know, That's right. They, yeah. It doesn't lessen anything. My, my point yeah. is that it's complex, our relationship with trauma. Yeah. Um, but it is, it is part of the human experience. That's right. To be willing to put ourselves out there, to, mm-hmm. to be willing to be so sensate that, you know, it hurts – when your finger is crushed, but it also hurts psychologically when mm-hmm. your dreams are crushed, when you have to grieve the life you imagined for yourself, that hurts too. And I think that mind pain is, uh, is, is not recognized enough. And I'm a brain surgeon saying that because I, I, I get the material, but I also get uh, the people who have gone through these cancer journeys. And so what people ask me, like, what, what should people do now in this pandemic? I said, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just, I'm explaining the few things that I know. But I, I do think this is an opportunity to make mental health, preventative mental health a thing. Right. They're always, man, how, why do we know so much about the heart and cholesterol? I keep telling people, like, is, but we don't know much about the brain. We don't talk about the brain. Let every kid build programs, for, not, not when they're having mental health issues, but along the way sort of mental health approaches mm-hmm. again the systemic resilience as well mm-hmm. as a processive it's the, the mental health approaches they carry with them and the ones they'll learn and deploy when trauma comes mm-hmm. because we put mm-hmm. ourselves out there in life yeah. and that's also where the exhilaration and the joy and the love come from so i wouldn't trade it but um uh you know it can hurt at times and uh, mm-hmm. there's that children's book where it says in the first sentence is life is difficult Mm-hmm. And I think um, I think trauma is something that can have value. Um, it's nothing we ever ask for. So you know, if somebody's listening or some of my patients, like you're saying, like we should get cancer because there's value in trauma, or I've been assaulted, or no, no, I'm not saying that at all. I'm actually saying it can have value because it forces you to deal with an aftermath that you never invited upon yourself mm-hmm. and don't want. Right. And I just want people to know that in, in the cancer center, my patients, <laughs> when, I, when I take care of them, it's a traumatic experience often. Mm-hmm. Met, meet them 15 minutes later, they're signing a paper that says I'm gonna open their skull next week. Mm-hmm. It's, it's an intense mm-hmm. human interaction. Trauma is part of that. Mm-hmm. Yet I don't see a lot of, you know, you would think they're a macabre, sad, despondent bunch and they're not so it's like that's you know people are like oh my gosh we're gonna hear from a cancer surgeon it's gonna be a depressing no 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 wait a second wait a second they, they actually i've seen you know i've seen more sort of people struggling affluent in los angeles at the mall and right <laughs> at the schools <laughs> than at the cancer center so i tried to pull some of those lessons out and my own personal journey and put it in the book but yeah. i'm i'm inspired by my patients you know that 
Wow, I think that's probably a good place to kind of wrap this up. So life on a nice edge, brain surgeon's reflections on life, loss and survival. And uh, Rahul, and your, you. your last name is pronounced Jandiel. Jandiel, perfect. Jandiel. Dr. Rahul Jandiel. Um, what about social media or do you have a place that people can learn Just, more or send you yeah. a At Dr. Jandiel, okay. D-R-J-A-N-D-I-A-L. It's more of a creative space. I try okay. to show like brain cells and trees and sort of the, okay. the ways that things connect that people wouldn't suspect. Um, mm -hmm. I think if we think of our brains and you, you put it under a microscope and you see how beautiful it is. Um, yeah, interesting. I would love to go observe a brain surgery yeah. someday. Or just <laughs> look at the pictures, uh, you know, just actually the brain surgery, living, seeing the living brain is something, not in a jar. But right. also, you know, you look at, just look up like ancient drawings of, uh, of neurons. I mean, they look like kelp forests. Right. And, I mean, it's something to behold. And then you, then you look at that and you go, wait a second, those trees in Oregon, and then this microscopic neuron look a lot if, like yeah. I mean, if you put if you change the scale and you start to see like how nate the, you know the nature of, it it doesn't constrain us but understanding the nature inside our minds and our bodies can also inform us to what is possible and how to approach things so uh, that's my next journey is to spend some time and try to think about you know uh, the sort of the you know human nature but actually down to how we you know, just a riff. I know we were going to wrap and this up. And what's the brain of Mother Earth? There you go. I like that. And why, I was just finished with this. Why is it, why is it like cosmic dust, lithium, right. Li plus or minus? I don't remember it from Berkeley, but on the periodic table, that little element is given to treat bipolar disorder. It can blunt mania and improve depression, and it pops off of a comet. Like, to me... If I could try to understand how the human mind connects to it's elements stardust, yeah. to, to stardust, is it? That's well. Thank you, sir. Nobody's going to read that, but I'm going to love well, it. Well, I will. I <laughs> I'm going to love I'm going to love learning about that. I right? think that's that, that that is a new frontier of thinking, you know, like looking at kind of the metaverse meta mind. You know, mm -hmm. it's like we're going there anyways with this idea of like all minds connected to the Internet someday. I, you know, yeah. what does that mean? Singularity. What does that mean? But also, I think, you know, everything is alive, every, and we're connected to everything. Yeah. So it's possible that everything is mind. Yeah. And we're just experiencing a little separate aspect of it. Yeah. That's a, very, that's a very Eastern perspective, but. But an important one. Yeah. To, you know, these the perspectives. You know, you know, people don't have to drink the Kool Aid, but they should right. know about they should, it. They should reflect on it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks again for your time. I really appreciate My pleasure. it. All right, folks, that's it for this podcast. Uh, Dr. Rahul, uh, Dr. Rahul Jandiel. Perfect. Man, got that one right. Um, go check him out at his uh, Instagram or wherever you, you can find him and, and read his book. Excellent book, Life on a Nice Edge. Thanks so much for your time. Stay focused. Until next time, be unbeatable. Divine out.